In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to you all. I'm Father Simon, the parish priest here in the parish of Minehead. We're part of the Diocese of Bath and Wells. Welcome to one of our churches, St Andrews, in Wellington Square in Minehead, on this festival of the baptism of Christ. And welcome to this service where we're going to offer you four messages of hope. Those messages come out of passages of scripture that members of the community here have chosen. At the end of our service, there'll be an opportunity for us all to renew our baptismal vows. And you might like to light a candle either now or at that point uh, to remind you that Jesus is the light of the world. We begin with a moment of silence. Because God was merciful, he saved us through the water of rebirth and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. But through sin, we have fallen away from our baptism let us return joyfully to the Lord and renew our faith in his promises by confessing our sins in penitence. You raise the dead to life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit, the torn and the divided. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello everybody, many of you already know me, I'm Diane. I'm one of the church wardens here in the parish of Minehead. And today I have chosen some verses from Psalm 42. Um, this is as a result actually of a friend sending me some words of encouragement. She's a friend and a fellow Christian. And she reminded me on how much I love the hymn As the Deer Pants for the Water uh, by Martin Nystrom. And I've been humming it for days now. You know what it's like when you get a song in your head. Well, that's that's what's happened to me. And so this short narrative, this small talk that I've done for you um, has been inspired by that. So I'm going to read verses one to three and verses 11 from Psalm 42. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation Bible. As the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O oh God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and stand before him? Day and night, I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Saviour, and my God. How many times have we heard or said we are living through interesting times? The days of having to stay at home seem endless and as one month slides or rolls into another we wonder when it will end, when we can get back to some normality. And this period just after Christmas sometimes feels like that too, where we can feel downhearted, discontented, or experiencing feelings of emptiness or anticlimax. We are not alone in these feelings as this psalm demonstrates. The first three verses speak of a person searching their soul for answers, where experiences or circumstances of life have tempted them to question things. Where life seems 
um, hard and dreary, we long for something to refresh us. It is easy to question God when things are not going our way, when times are difficult. We can trap ourselves into thinking that God is not really there or that God is not really working to make things better and we start to question him. At present and periodically over a number of months, we've not been able to attend church to join our family in worship and that sense of community. Have you felt that loss at not being able to attend church to see your God? Or have you experienced a need in your heart just to get back to some normality? I know that at times I have. But we must remember that God is all around us. He is beside us wherever we are and he has a plan. In this passage that I read, the deer longs and needs water in the same way that our souls long for and need God. Our souls may feel dry at the moment and we may be fearful or unable to flee the pressures of life that seem to pursue us. But God is our fountain of life and he is the satisfaction for our weary soul. He is the God of comfort. God is faithful and God is love. Therefore, there is room and reason for hope. God alone is the only one who can satisfy our thirsty soul and he alone can protect our hearts and minds. So let's not doubt, not let doubt or trouble pull us too far away from God. God can see us through anything if we trust in him, if we obey him and if we pray to him. He will lift us up when we are feeling down. So let's put our hope in the Lord. He alone is our strength and shield. And let's start to be thankful for what uh, we have around us and what we have in our lives and what we can plan later on this year. John of, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. So let's keep that hope going and look to the future. Amen.
The first letter of St John, chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. I recently learnt the meaning of a word, or rather two words, which I suspect you will either love or loathe. My apologies if it's the latter. It relates to the problem of getting a tune stuck in your head, which insists on going round and round. I can find this infuriating. Apparently it's called an earworm. Uh, and I have a couple of passages of music which I employ to dislodge such an earworm. Well, I have the same with a few Bible passages. If I get an infuriating earworm of a thought which I can't remove, I have a few passages of scripture which I turn to. And this short passage from the first letter of John is one of them. If ever I need hope, this is where I turn. It has two sentences, particularly, that I love and hold on to. Or perhaps they hold on to me. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. For that is what we are. And the second. When he, that is Jesus, is revealed, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. The first looks back to an action of God the Father already accomplished. See what love the Father has given us. And this is important. It's God who has done this, not me. So it's secure. I can depend on it. And I love the next phrase. See what love the Father has given us. That we should be called children of God. For that is what we are. What a beautiful thing. The second cause for hope lies in the future. When he, that is Jesus, is revealed, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Three wonderful things. Jesus will return when things are really difficult and the present moment is very hard, either personally or for loved ones. I think of the return of Jesus. And for what follows on from that, which John summarises so well, we shall see him as he is, and we will be like him. It's a wonderful thing, and it saves me from thinking about myself, because we will be like him.
The Magnificat. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zachariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there will be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and then returned to her home. The story of Mary and Elizabeth meeting together is something that shows us that our Lord's special identity was already known, even if only in part. He isn't even born yet. He is only recently conceived, but he is alive in his mother's womb. Mary is blessed because of the fruit of her womb, and that fruit is the Lord. The Magnificat, the Song of Mary, is a response to Elizabeth's words. And after hearing what Elizabeth has said about her and her child, Mary responds in verse. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he has regarded the lowly state of his, man, of his maidservant. For behold, all generations will call me blessed. Mary states that this is a fulfilment of God's promises. So what can the Magnificat tell us today? I believe that the Magnificat shows us that the Lord specially blesses the poor and the lowly. Mary was not a particularly special woman prior to being chosen by God. We have no reason to think she was flawed in any particular way, but she was clearly humble and lacking in nobility. She describes herself as holding a lowly estate. And God worked in her completely through his power. She conceived a son quite apart from any natural ways. And while her body certainly participated in the bearing of the child, this wasn't actually some active choice where Mary did her bit. Rather, she accepted the gift God gave her, and she continued in that acceptance. 
God loves to exalt the lowly and he loves us to do all the work along the way. The Magnificat also reminds us to be aware of worldly riches and powers. At the same time, our Lord is exalting the lowly. He is pulling down the mighty. He humbles the proud and he does this by bringing them down. If you are rich, the Gospel tells us, you will have a hard time entering the kingdom. You will have a hard time acknowledging your need. You will have had a hard time being hungry and so beware anything that makes you feel strong and self-sufficient. Live in hope. Live for the Lord. Many years ago, I was asked what my desert island piece of scripture would be. And in truth, there are many Bible passages that hold a special place in my heart. My answer to that question, and when I'm thinking about hope, would be the feeding of the 5,000, as recorded in the Gospel of John. And the passage reads as follows. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a loud crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't think that hope is something we can just choose to feel, rather that it grows within us over many days and weeks and years of our lives and bubbles away, affected by the different human and the different godly experiences that we all have. So where in this passage do I find hope? Hope of a future that is different to the present. I find hope in the sheer curiosity and persistence of the crowd following Jesus. They knew that Jesus was special. I find hope in the sense of control and authority that Jesus has in the face of the doubt of Philip. I find hope in Andrew's understanding that even though the boy had only five barley loaves and two fish, that Jesus might just be able to do something with this very modest amount of food. And I find the greatest hope of all in the extraordinary words of Jesus when he told his disciples Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. Of course, these words are partly about the barley loaves and the fish, but I also think that they're about the whole of humanity, and that Jesus came that nothing and no one 
may be lost. For me, in this single sentence, is the truth of the gospel of good news, the truth of the whole story of the life of Jesus, and the truth of the love of God. Whilst I exercise a little moment of linguistic license by changing the word nothing to no one, in the light of the greatest story ever, the story of God, and how God reached down in love to save us, I think that linguistic license is actually justified. In a way, every one of us is a little fragment of humanity whom Jesus came, that none of us may be lost, whom Jesus came to save. This is the hope that I cling to day in, day out, when filled with joy or when filled with sadness, when filled with confidence or when filled with doubt. Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing so that no one may be lost. Amen. So friends, we come to the liturgy of the renewal of our baptismal promises. We all wander far from God and lose our way. Jesus Christ comes to find us and welcomes us all home. In baptism, we respond to his call. God calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light, and to follow Jesus Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask you, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and the corruption of evil? Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and from neighbour? Do you turn to Jesus as Saviour? Do you submit to Jesus as Lord? Do you come to Jesus the way, the truth and the life? Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So dear friends, go well and please do keep very safe in these troubling and troublesome times. And please hold the NHS and all of those key workers in your daily prayers. May God protect you and may God protect them all. May God who in Christ gives us a spring of water welling up to eternal life, perfecting you the image of his glory and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those that you love and pray and care for this day and always. Amen.